This episode is brought to you by Workbox. Getting ready to make a difference. Okay. And uh, what me, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another episode of Podcast and Chill. And please welcome the beautiful and the talented Sammy Sosa. We have a lot of audience here. <laughs> oh my goodness, I'm so envious. Um, I'm looking at your alcohol in the back. I'm like, oh fuck, I could do with the bottle there. Listen, to get what's behind me took a very long time. I don't want to give too many secrets away, but I had my original stock. And I had to do some hustling for the past couple of days, so yeah. And uh, how's lockdown been treating you? Look, I think um, it's been it's been very interesting. I think for a lot of people, it's been really really good because it's been keeping them out of trouble. Um, I thought about it: no cops, no bribes, no nothing, no making reckless decisions. But I think for me, the biggest part of lockdown is self discovery and reflection. Um, I'm so fortunate enough to do the lockdown for my partner and my son. Unfortunately, my other son is, is away. But I'm happy to just be around loved ones. And it's made things so much easier. Yeah, and I'm sure you're used to it because your, your career has been on quarantine for a while, you know? Yeah. I mean... <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow. Okay. <laughs> No, 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 but I'm kidding. I, I know we're laughing about it, but the, the thing that I found, because um, I was once in the industry, then I went out, but when I wasn't in the industry, uh, it was a time to reflect and look at all the things that really matter in life and be grateful for those things, you know, because the, the industry can become so toxic. Yeah, yeah. Look, I think uh, if I had to go a couple of years back, I mean, I'm not originally from Joburg. Um, I came here just like you started Why? And I mean, it was so different. The culture, the environment, this, uh, you know, sudden fame was very, very new to me. And all I just wanted to do was make incredible radio and mm. talk to people, you know, it was never about me. And of course things happen quite quickly. You know, you don't often see people go from, from radio to television. It's usually the other way around. So for me, it was like, boom, Y, then BN, boom, then six months later, SABC, Metro FM. So mm-hmm. everything happened in such a short space of time that there was never, and I probably have to blame myself, but there was never a moment to just take a step back and mm-hmm. chill and be like, okay, cool. This is where I'm at. What's my next move? Is this good for me? Is this good for my pocket? Is this good for my friends and family? Yeah. So I think that's probably one of the things now looking back, I'm like, oh, should I wish... I wish I had slowed things down. Who was advising you during all of this? Like, did you have a mentor? Did you have anyone you looked up to or someone that was guiding you? Look, I think um, Mo Flavor was definitely one of the guys who took time to, when he was not in studio, would send me messages and, you know, tell me not to say certain things. And that was like a really, really big help for me. I've always admired him. I've always respected him. I've always really, really looked at him as one of the radio legends yeah and you know a couple of months later i got to work with him which was which is very different you know i got to see him in a different light Mm. but i would definitely have to say that during that time of why he was definitely you know a bit of a pillar for me Mm. um but i was alone i mean i didn't have much family here i didn't have any friends i didn't even have a place to stay so for me, it was like, I'm just, I'm just winging it. I'm just going to see what happens. So why did you leave Cape Town then? Was it like a part of the plan? No, it was never part of the plan. I mean, I, I remember, you know, my son, my first son was born and I was still doing a bit of campus radio. I, I loved being on UCT radio. I mean, of course it wasn't, um, you know, as big as, yes. as commercial radio, but I loved it, you know, and then I remember meeting Scoop at at a party in Cape Town and he was blown away by my energy. Yeah. Just my vibe. You know, and of course, you know, we have a lot of things in common. You know, we love, we love music. We love the culture. So he was like, 
give it a go. You know, why don't you just come up to Joburg and, and, and try it out? And, and I did it, but the timing was just terrible. So know? when you land this side, you didn't know anyone? No, no, I didn't. Oh, I didn't. Yeah. I, 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 I mean, I have my aunt who lives in Baklu, mm. and I, I kind of tried to stay with her for a little bit, but of course, you know, the late nights, the partying, the drinking, I mean, she had it. Mm. And at the time, my son was three months old, so I had him with me as well, just trying to navigate. Life. How old are you at this time? I was about 24. Fuck me. Yeah, 24. Yeah. So, I mean, of course, you know, with time, I, I had to make a decision. I had to leave. I spent, you know, a couple of weeks in hotels. I had to send my son off to Pretoria to live with, you know, his dad's family. And as much as it was good for me to focus on myself and my career, it was still extremely lonely. I mean, I didn't have, uh, you know, my son, I didn't have family. And I think, you know, to have two brothers living in Joburg, you would think that there'll be a really, really strong support system, but it's Joburg. Everybody's, everybody's busy. Everybody's trying to, you know, focus on their own hustle. Everybody's trying to deal with their own shit. So it was, it was tough. And there was no one that you modeled your career around, like maybe a Bonang or someone like that. I don't think so. I think, you know, one thing that sort of set me apart from everybody else was, I suppose, the way I sounded, uh, I suppose, the way that I looked, you know, I came through with all these tats and people couldn't really put a face to the voice. And I think even, you know, when I did a bit of work with Mo and um, uh, Nonche on Club 808, it was like, you know what, I'll just do this for free because I want people to put a face to the voice. I want to be out there. I want to, I want to be a star, you know? Um, and I think I was banking on sounding different, looking different, having a different energy, not being able to, you know, put myself out there in a way that people are like, yeah, she's like that. Oh, yeah, she's that person. You know, I intrigue people. So I think I was just myself, but of course I did kind of get swallowed in a lot of things. Dude, I heard rumors that you slept your way to the top. Is that true? Oh, that is not true at all. That is not true. Fuck, I was I hoping think... it was true, man. So if you tell me who to sleep with, I'm trying to get to the top, yo. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. Even if there were three men, I, I'd know. Look, I think, you know, you hear all these stories and you, you think about it, you know. You think about using people. You think about lying, you know. You think about also giving up your pride and your dignity and, and your morals and your ethic codes and things like that. But I didn't, I couldn't. Mm -hmm. And I didn't think that it's something that one needed to do. You know, like I thought about it and I was like, no, but surely if I had the talent, surely if I am committed, surely if I'm this person that's out there, it's not necessary. Yeah. And, you know, even when I went through my, call it dip at Metro mm -hmm. FM, it crossed my mind, like, why, why am I not just dropping the jeans for mm. a really short skirt? Mm. Or, you know, why am I not leaving the radio thing for a little bit to just make some friends on the eighth floor or whatever it is, you know? Mm. So of course it, it crossed my mind, but it's something I've never done. It's something that I would never do. Mm. Um, I come from a family full of people who are well-traveled, but worked in politics. You know, and it's it's dirty, it's ugly, it's 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 filled with a lot of hatred and jealousy and things like that. And I thought that, you know, there's no way the entertainment industry could be could be the same. But I was obviously a bit naive. But did you see it happened? Uh, did you come across that? Did you see girls dropping their jeans? No, I, hmm. I I I think one thing that people have to remember is that. I didn't have any girlfriends. I don't think I've ever had any girlfriends. There was a, a time when I was quite close to Mamuzi and Miss Cosmo. And we had like a little, you know, three girl wolf pack type of thing. <laughs> but, and, and it was fun. I mean, I still remember we went on a, on a road trip to, to Sun City. Miss Cosmo was playing there. Everybody was there and Paul Pops was out there. It was so much fun, you know? But I've just never really had girl best friends. I've never, I've never had female friends, you know? Um, even more so, I've never really had a conversation with any girl in the industry about the industry itself. People who they hate, people who they, 
wish they had slept with people who they want to date, people mm -hmm. who they're having a fling with, I suppose. And for me, it was never really, it never really excited me to have a boyfriend in the industry or, you know, to sleep with somebody in the industry, you know? And I, I, I even remember, I mean, everything is coming back to me. I, when I worked uh, for DSTV at MultiChoice, myself and Spuda were very close, you know? In fact, myself, AKA the whole gang, we were really tight. And uh, he actually had a place in the same complex as me in Daneford. And literally a couple of weeks later, I was in the paper. Because I think at the time he was dating Carol, uh, mm -hmm. who, who was working, you know, at, at Supersport. And people just said, I mean, how can you go and take Carol's man? And, I, you know, I would see this woman in the building at Multi-Choice. And I would think to myself, I mean, she is like somebody who you should never touch. You know, she's, <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, so yeah. it kind of all came together that it's just a very weird place to be in. You know, you, you don't know walking next to somebody what the other person might think or what everybody else might think. Living in the same complex, what, you know, the neighbors will see and, you know, how they'll take that out of context. Mm. So, no, to answer your question. <laughs> and, and are you still in touch with uh, some people in the industry? Because what I realize is that, um, you know, like when you're popping and you're famous, everybody wants to be a friend because they can gain something from you. But the moment you can't offer them something back, then <laughs> you don't gain shit. <laughs> but I learned that very uh, quickly when I left the industry. You know, I wouldn't say I learned that when I was, when I was doing my thing. Um, one thing, you know, I, I've, I've always maintained is when I was at Y, every Friday, I used to do these interviews with like, two, three artists from different genres. I mean, I remember uh, one day it would be KO and Black Motion in the same room. Nice. Uh, the music, the couple, like all these guys. And every single time when we finished that interview, I'd get a number, I'd get a proposal, I'd get a proposition. Let's work together. Let's have this conversation further or take this conversation further. And I think it was purely based on my authenticity, my you know, ability to bring people together and say, look, we don't have to be friends. We don't have to make music together, but we need to appreciate what we're each doing. And I think, you know, that's something that the industry at large hasn't really looked at, you know, like how can I be a DJ and a presenter and a motivational speaker and a reality show star and an MC and a, I don't know, football player and a whatever, you know? So, I mean, today I can listen to a song and call somebody up and be like, hey, do you know that song? And they will respond. They mm -hmm. will have the same respect and energy that they had with me four or five years ago. And I think it's, it's, it's me. It's me saying that who you really sat down and had a conversation with. Like, are you, still, are you still tight with Namuzli and, and Miss Cosmo? Look, I think, you know, if we, if we had to see each other, We'd be cool, we'd be civil, we'd be friendly, you know. Um, but that's but what I'm trying to understand. Why is it that now it's you cordial, but back then when you're in the industry, you guys were like, like you said, you were like a trio of, of, yeah. of a bandit of girls. Well, what changed? That's what I'm trying to say. Is it because now you're not in that same spotlight? Yes. Look, I think part of it is probably because I'm not in that, you know, same environment anymore. I'm not going to every single party. I'm not at every single, you know, event. I'm not on every single lineup. Um, a part of me does miss that, you know. It, it was really nice to have my name on a flyer. It was really nice to get the VIP treatment. Um, things have changed also. Like, you know, when I'm trying to have a birthday tour at like six, seven, eight different places, they don't know me. And I don't know if it's because, you know, management has changed. Yeah, it still feels a bit entitled. I'm like, yeah, but I also used to come here every Thursday. And, and, and you know, it's like, I, I can't understand, you know? But at the same time, you know, I get it. I get that, you know, I've moved on. Mm -hmm. And I get that I've also grown up a little bit. I get mm -hmm. that I've also made a lot of mistakes. And I've mm -hmm. learned from them. You know, and I mean, I haven't had a very easy life, a very easy 
uh, sort of stretch in this industry. You know, when, when, did, when did you when would you say you, your your career uh, started taking um, a dip, as you say? What what do you think was the turning point? You know. Look, I mean, in the beginning, it was great. Uh, we had Y, we had Club 8, we had Metro FM, which came literally six, seven months later after wow. I started. Wow. And this was very unusual because, I mean, you have the monkeys of the world who are exceptional, but were never chosen or were never mm. asked to, 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 to go to a 947 or a mm. Metro, whatever the case is, you know. But I didn't care. I was like, you know, and it was never for me to throw it in anybody's face or think that I'm better. It was like, you know, if it's my time, it's my time. And, you know, Metro was such a beautiful platform. It's huge. I mean, the listenership is huge. And to go from Hawaii to Metro, it's like your audience is totally different. The content is totally different. The music is totally different, you know. But people loved, you know, to hear my opinion. They, they loved the way that I sounded. They... They didn't also like the fact that Mo sometimes, you know, tried to overshadow me. And it was like, is this not your show as well? You're not a guest, you know? So why, why are you having like 2% of the airtime type of thing, you know? And at the time as well, I was also asked to be the host of The Hustle, first season of The Hustle, which was like, oh my goodness, you know? Great but show, by the way. Like, Fucking loved it, man. Woo. Thank you, sir. I mean, let's let's talk about the makeup game, <laughs> the attire, the hair, the con. Like, you know, I I was like, it didn't feel real. You know, it felt so surreal that this was happening. But because of you know just the type of person that I am, I was like, you know what, the 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 the, the ethical thing to do, or the honest thing to do, is to go to the SABC and say, listen. I have this offer, I have this opportunity, you know? And they said, but why, you know? You need to go home and write a whole motivational letter as to why you need to be the host of the show. And they asked the, the guys who are producing The Hustle to do the same. They said, we need a letter from the production company to motivate why you should just go and do your thing, you know? And time was, 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 was not on our side, you know? I can't wait for somebody to approve um, my life. I can't wait for somebody to approve my next move, you know? And I thought that at least by me coming to you is enough, at least by me saying, this is what my endeavors are going to be like, mm -hmm. you can say, okay, cool. But you know, there needs to never be a conflict of interest. And there never was, because what I do is I'd wake up at five, I do my show in the morning, eight till 20, 10 with Mo. I'd, you know, hang around for an hour or two, I drive to Northcliff where we were shooting the hustle, mm -hmm. and that would be like a nine, 10 hour day, and I'd do it all over again. Mm -hmm. But I think, again, I did not slow down. I did not take things one step at a time. I didn't take things one day at a time. I didn't understand that, you know, sleep is just such a precious thing. Like, we take sleep for granted. We take things like alcohol. We don't, I mean, we just drink, you know, we just, keep drinking, you know, um, you know, substances, it's all over, you know, and I think at some point I just, I just lost it. I was exhausted. I was ill. I never slept. I, I just didn't have the right energy for anything, you know, I felt sick and I had explained myself and, and, and I think that how they twisted it was, you're obviously lying. You're not ill. Mm -hmm. You're out shooting a reality show for multi-choice, you know? And I had shown them my entire schedule. I'd said, but, but here's when I was shooting and here's my pay slip or whatever that shows exactly the days I was at work when I was shooting, you know, you paid me for those days type of thing. And, and I think during that whole process, I try to fight it, but I realized that people don't always have your best interest at heart. People don't always want to hear you speak your mind. People don't always want to, you know, give you a platform to have your five minutes of fame. You know? And wh where was Mo in all of this? Did he have your back or did he throw you under the bus during this whole process? Oh, well, you know, I would probably still be with him if he didn't throw me under the bus. Mm. You know? I mean, we're a team, you know, you know, on radio, you've got 
the host, co-host, the producer, you know, you're all just a team and you're working together. And, you know, we were all parents, you know, we all have families, we mm. all, you know, should have some sort of empathy, some sort of sympathy, some sort of like, and, and we never humanize situations. We never look at a situation and be like, okay, she was just on this road to success and she never took one second to think about anything else but what she was doing, you know? Mm. Um, and it's sad. I mean, it, it, it saddens me. I'm, there's a part of me that's extremely disappointed in myself because I did get swallowed by a lot of things. And I thought that I could just get a lawyer and fight this easy. But who, mm. who am I? Mm. You know? mm. So sometimes I do wish that I could go back. But then I look at the situation and I'm like, oh my goodness, here's an offer from Power FM. Mm. So actually, I don't even care. You know, why, why should I even care about, you know, this eight to 10 show when I can have my own show, mm. you know, Power FM. Mm. And, um, you know, it, it, it was great. I met you know, all sorts of incredible people. Um, you know, at the time, the music compiler, Mandla, he was just full of energy and he, he backed me and he fought for me and he gave me incredible music Saturdays and Sundays, six to nine, you know? But what I didn't realize is that during everything that was happening, I was still not okay. I was still not, I was still not okay. Mm. You know, I can do a radio show here and there, but have I gotten over my addiction, for example? Have I gotten over my selfishness to be in the limelight? Have I gotten over everything? Have I even gotten over the fact that people fired me when I did nothing wrong? Yeah. You know, people don't see it that way, you know. But what I've learned to accept is that all you have to do is have a conversation with somebody, like face to face, mm. and hear things from their mouth from other people's mouths because you know when you look in the mirror it's you seeing that person nobody else is in the mirror with you it's you That's so it. if you look in the mirror and you can see this beautiful person who's talented who, who has a dimbriyama who mm -hmm. has you know pat game like that's the person who it is the big heart the enthusiasm the talent the authenticity the love the respect so the, yeah. the addiction, was it just alcohol or did you dabble in other substance abuse? Yeah, I did. I did. And it wasn't, um, it wasn't out of choice, I suppose. Do you still remember um, your first line? No, well, I might actually, I, I might. Yes, I, yeah. I, I think I do. I do. And um, I what, still what remember. That? It was, it was a, a Thursday night and I was off to Kantari, um, but I was not happy. I was not, I was not happy. I was not, you know, trying to do it because everybody else was doing it. Um, I was, I was a very sad and lonely individual, you know, and this is not something that you can just talk to anybody about, you know, because everybody's happy. Like everybody's just, lit you know and, and, <laughs> and you're like yeah we get that but other stuff also going on inside you know here here you know is this at the and, height of your career i think like maybe a year later mm. a year a bit later you know so you get to um, Qatar and you're like, let me just try this thing out yeah and you know it was great <laughs> <laughs> But, you know, then you, you look at the, the situation and you're like, but that's not everything, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and it took me a very, very long time to get out of that, you mm -hmm. know? I, I, and, I, and, I, and, I, and, I, and I, not that I enjoy speaking about it, but it's important to speak about it because, you know, once an addict, always an addict, you know? Mm -hmm. um, when did yeah, you realize that shit? Okay, I think I'm addicted now. Look, that never happens, you know. It, you know, a person can never be honest with themselves and say, oh my goodness, you know, this is, yeah, this is like rock bottom. That's, I don't think that's, that's ever happened, you know. 
But I did find myself in a recess ward years ago. I did find myself, you know, saying, you know, it's cool, I can just go home. And, you know, when you're in a recess ward, it's just you and no one else because they're trying to save you. They're trying to, they're trying to save your life, you know? And even at that time, I mean, I remember being there from eight o'clock at night till 3 a.m. And only at 3 a.m. did I have the courage to call someone. And I called my brother. Mm. I called my brother Mojack. And he, you know, came there. And, you know, of course, then my parents found out and whatever. I spent seven days in the ICU. Damn. And literally, as soon as, I mean, when you're in the ICU, there's a lot of shit going on there. I mean, well, there's all sorts of people, you know, in there and they're there for different reasons. You know, there's a pipe here, there's a thing here, person next to you. But how much, how much coke do you have to do to be, to end up in a situation like that? I would Look, about- it wasn't like that. It, it wasn't actually that. I, I, I one day just like was alone in my apartment and I, you know, had a couple of paracetamol you know capsules and stuff what is that and I, I don't know what that is it's just uh, a very strong uh, version of panado oh, okay so yeah I, mm. I had about had about 20 of those and Jeez, why would you have so many it's unexplainable like if i had to be very honest it's it's really unexplainable uh yeah it happened and were you trying to numb the pain of course of course. I mean, no one, well, I mean, okay, let me not say no one, but I, I'm not going to admit to the fact that I made mistakes. I, you know, trusted everybody. I thought everybody was my friend. You know, I wish I was there and not here. I wish, you know, it's like a whole bunch of things that like, you, you don't want to admit to, you know, you're like, oh, okay, cool. You know? And I remember that the day I got out of the ICU ward and I went to the normal ward, it was like an angel that came to the door and it was my mother. Wow. She, by the way, she, she lives in Cape Town. And, you know, when you're, when you're there, you, you see a psychiatrist, you see a therapist, or a psychologist rather. And it was very difficult because I, I couldn't concentrate. I, I didn't know what was happening. I couldn't bark myself, that kind of stuff. You know? And of course I confided in this woman you know, the psychiatrist, and I said, you know, I don't know if I have a problem, but something's happening, you know. Mm. And she divulged all of that information to my mom. And I thought to myself, but don't you have this old thing of yours, Mm. you know, as a time? And I think it was probably the best thing that she could have done for my life because my mom then said, look, I know what's going on, but you have a choice to make. You either go to a facility and be institutionalized or whatever the case is, or you come to Cape Town. And I was like, let's go, you know. I went to Cape Town and, you know, just to be with family was like the most unforgettable thing ever, you know. Like I'm finally not alone. Mm. I have my mom and my dad who are totally, totally like in this, like they're both next to me, no judgment, no, you know, swearing and all sorts of things. Mm. And for 60 days, I spent, you know, an hour each day at either an NA meeting or an AA meeting. Mm. Like everywhere, you know, I'm talking about like, like colored, suburbs going mm-hmm. to a meeting there and then i'm going to like cock bay you know, <laughs> and then I, you know i'm with the whites in claremont you know and listening to their stories of their addiction or whatever the case is and then i'm back you know in athlone with gullets and you know i don't think that the stories that i heard scared me i think more than anything it enlightened me mm. you know it, you're not alone it, yeah And I was like, there are people in these rooms who have been drinking and using for as long as I've been alive. Wow. That's that's crazy. Mm. And then you think about, you know, you you visualize 
Oh, Sammy, it's like, Sammy, Sammy, no ways, bro. Like, yeah, it's crazy. I mean, you visualize this, this, this lady living with her husband who has this addiction, throwing his car keys out of the window into the street so that he doesn't leave to drink or to use or whatever the case is. And you visualize these stories. And yes, it's supposed to be, you know, anonymous. I don't know these people's names, but it's the reality. Yeah. But my thing is, my thing is, like, I can't believe this was happening while you were, like, you know, doing all the biggest radio gigs, all the biggest TV shows, like, you were there. Like, from afar, I'm thinking, shit, she's living the life. But She's got her shit together. You know what I mean? But behind closed doors, all this was happening. Yeah. Fuck. And, hell. Well, you know, I, I, I think that what people don't realize is that it's, it's okay to, to just vanish for a mm-hmm. month or two, it's okay to, you know, self-reflect. It's okay to, you know, spend more time with loved ones than, you know, three, four, five, six, seven, eight DJs, you know. But what, what were some of the nice things? What are some of the nice things that you like about the industry? Like, you know, you, I mean, I mean, you mentioned, you know, being in the VIP and stuff like, what were some of the nice things that you miss and like you enjoyed? Look, I think, um, you know, if I really had to be honest, being in VIP section is really nice and <laughs> having a rider is cool. And, you know, before I was doing all the MC stuff, you know, getting a shout out, you know, that was, that was quite nice. But I think the biggest thing for me was getting to meet people. Mm-hmm. Like, I have met some legends in my career, mm-hmm. you know. I, I, I've been able to interview the likes of Talib Kweli wow. and Davido. And, oh, nice. you know, I mean, some people can say, yeah, but Davido's my friend. But for me, I was never trying to be friends with, with the guy, you know. I was, trying to, I was trying to sit and own this interview and have a conversation with an African or an international, rather, superstar, you know. I still remember my interview with Talib Kweli. It was like... I was like, no ways. I mean, I know all this guy's music. And <laughs> you know. So for me, it was like getting to have conversations with these people, you know. And I think even after, you know, I went through everything and getting clean and, you know, being clean for years. I mean, I, I, I kind of managed to get my act together. You know, mm-hmm. I was part of a Touch HD lineup. You know, I I got a I got a heads up from Gareth Cliff. I mean, Gareth Cliff was a fan. Gareth mm-hmm. Cliff even invited me to his radio show, and he was so oh, jacked up on on the information about me, where I went to school, where I did radio. Like, I was like, holy shit, is this happening? And again, I was like, yeah, okay, you're you're a legend. You know, just mm-hmm. not not like everybody else, but to me, I was like, yeah, actually, I'm I'm someone. Mm. And um, you know, then you know, you 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 do radio with the likes of O'Neill Africa, and he is fantastic, you know. But also, you think to yourself, but this is not about O'Neill. It's not about my producer. This is about me and where I'm at. And I am looking at my career, and I'm saying, shit, I'm sitting and interviewing Rafiki Zolo. I am sitting and listening to Zonke sing to me. You know, <laughs> I'm. Like, like that's how I that's how I looked at it. I was like, this is my moment. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. So if anything, you know, fuck the VIP, you know, all of that stuff. It's 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 cool and everything. I won't lie, it was great. But I can I can sometimes look at my phone and be like, yo, I've got pictures and pictures and pictures, and I had real conversations with people. And I think the 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 people are so quick to think that. Everybody's out to get them. You know, I remember mm. having a conversation with Nasty C. He was on my show. And off air, I asked him about his love life. And he was so quick to say, no, 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 we're not talking about that. No, 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 no. But, you know, we're not out to get everyone. We're not out to put your personal shit on radio. Mm. You know, it's me, Sam, having a conversation with you off air because my shit is together here. So I'm mm. not going to be pressing and clicking and panicking. You know, mm. I'm going to be getting to know you just as much as I want you to get to know me. So we, we're, we're all controlled to think, hey, you know, this question is going to, you know. What is the biggest out of bag you, you ever got? Like the biggest check? Whew. I think, you know, I, I, I wouldn't 
necessarily say that I got a big check from this particular gig. Mm -hmm. But what I can tell you is that when I was doing the hustle and I was working at the SABC, that bag alone every <laughs> month was hella. <laughs> you know? I won't even lie. Like, I was looking at the combined income. This is my hand sanitizer, by the way. The combined income. And I was like, okay, this is... <laughs> <laughs> we nice, we nice. We nice. And, and I still remember a very good friend of mine. I don't know if, if, if you know Menzi XL. Mm -hmm. He, uh, you know, once came to visit me with a couple of his friends. And, uh, you know, we were all going to go to this, this party. And, uh, you know, he said, you have a drink for me? And I said, yeah, sure. You know, open up the fridge. And there was like, dry lemon, appetizer, fanta. Like it was every, and he said, money changed you i said but my fridge is just full <laughs> i'm nice you know it's perfectly stacked it's like you know what you see on mtv cribs and it was like oh, money can you and I, I said no i'm just i'm feeding the fam with some dry yeah. lemon yeah, yeah yeah um and and you know <laughs> You know, it's crazy just hearing you talk. This happened in the life, in the time span of like three, two, five years. You know, it's crazy. Some people don't even do that in 20 years in their career. 100%. And, and um, you know, it, it's, it's really crazy because I think maybe a year ago or so, I went back to, um, oh, I have a bartender. Come over. Hey, it must so be this nice. Is this is my other half who's... Topping me up. You're quarantine oh. bay. It's a, it's a. Oh, yeah, yeah. Look at your face. Hey, how are you, my brother? How are you, bro? Thank oh, he's, you. he's the one laying the pipe. Nice one, nice one. <laughs> the bottom, man. I'm really great. So, um, yeah, like, you know, a year or two ago, I went back to Don't Look Down. They, of course, do all the production for, you know, Vuzu and, you know, Channel O, et cetera. And what was so crazy is that Tebojo who was there and you know the late Muhammad uh, you know he passed away a couple of weeks ago they said to me you know what this is actually our fault everything that happened to you in your entire career was our fault and I even remember being in the offices with you know the white man and you know everybody there and I was just so open about my problems and you know everything that was going on and they they wanted to help me you know, but you got to help yourself. You got to want to, to, to get out of the shithole that you're in, you know, and to hear them years later say, it's our fault that you landed up where you landed up. It's mm. crazy, you know, yeah. and it's like, I want to believe that it, it was their fault, but I can't do that because I also made choices, you know, and they say, yeah, but, but we were the ones that sent you to the Durban July and made you do all these Voxies and shoot VNT every day. And we promised you'll just do V Prime. And then we're like, no, but you're too good. So fool, we throw you into Vuzu. It's like, but, but yeah, that makes sense. Like, yes, actually you, you pushed me and you just put me out there. And, you know, I was just everywhere and never at home. Mm. But then I'm like... I can't blame other people for, for, for the choices that I made and the mistakes that I made. You know, I'm, I'm glad you bring that up because hindsight is such a good thing, you know? So when you look at yourself, like, what are some of the regrets that you wish you could have done better? And I, obviously, I'm asking this because it might help someone out there who's going through a similar journey to yours. But I feel everything happens for a reason, you know? Absolutely. And, and, and I, 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 that's how I live my life. But I don't know. What, what do you think? Look, I don't think I have any regrets. I... I one thing that, you know, I've really, really learned to, well, what my mantra is, is have gratitude, you know, is, is live your life with an abundance of gratitude. Um, I mean, where would I be if, you know, I didn't have my parents? Where would I be if I didn't have two beautiful children mm. who I have to do everything for? You know, where would I be if I didn't have the partner that I have today? And, you know, I, I think that, what people don't realize is that if you're in the industry, um, you're still a human being. You're still going to make mistakes. You are still going to, you know, get fucked up. You're still going to, you know, trust everyone, you know, when you shouldn't. You're, you're still going to be in situations where you're vulnerable. You're still going to, you know, just because you're in the industry, 
you you don't have to be perfect, you know. And I am okay with the decisions that I've made. I have done good in the world. I have not done great things, you know, but where I can and with the means that I have, I have hosted workshops for people mm. who would like to be in ministry. I put my whole life on a PowerPoint presentation and I said, if you want to take my story to the paper, be my guest. Mm. What I'm letting you know is that you don't want to be here. You don't want to mm. be around. You don't actually want to be, you know, the, the hottest DJ. You don't actually want to be, you know, and things are taken out of context. Like you wouldn't believe, you know, you, you'll say one thing and people are down your throat. You know, you're trending. You are, you know, you know, on, 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 on this, this hot seat, you know, and black Twitter is just coming after you. you know? Hey, black Twitter can be a bitch, eh? Yeah. I mean, you know, it's, it's, you literally sometimes think to yourself, holy shit, like, have these people never been on a hot seat? Or have these people never, you know, been criticized or judged? Have these people, you know what I mean? Like, they, I don't, I don't even know who they are. But, you know, <laughs> ask yourself, are you, are you guys that perfect? You know, mm. do you guys have your shit together? Mm. And sometimes we take small little accomplishments for granted, small little things like just by waking up and being able to say, you know what, I actually bought myself an apartment. Never mind buying my mother or my father a house. Fuck that. The fact that I can look after myself and be independent and have a roof over my head and, you know, be able to feed my children and have a partner who you know, has the same vision and supports my dreams and is absolutely behind me for everything. I mean, that's an accomplishment, you know. And that's what know everybody's that doing. That Everybody's doing that right now with COVID-19, you know. Uh, you were mentioning earlier that you need to take a month just to breathe. And I think that's what this COVID-19 is doing to the entire world. Everybody's absolutely. just stepping back yeah. and, and being grateful. Look, I think, yeah, absolutely. That's, that's why, you know, even now I'm like, yo, I thought I was super grateful but now i'm like a thousand times more grateful you, know? you still have and, alcohol yo <laughs> hey man hey man <laughs> look i mean you know we, we 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 i don't even think anybody knew what this lockdown was going to be like you know i mean isaac, isaac and i isaac's my partner so i mean we prepared for the lockdown we said we would stay the side and you know we're gonna spend X amount on booze, X amount. You in on, Cape Town, no? No, no, no. I'm here in 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 Waterfall. Oh, okay, Waterfall, yeah. Yeah. Mm. So we, you know, we went through this whole thing, and I mean, it's just crazy how during the week when there's no lockdown, you're going about your daily, you know, lives and doing your thing. But during lockdown, you're drinking every day, <laughs> eating more. You are, you know, just. It's, it's crazy, you know? I mean, how is it that six, I mean, I don't want to give too much away, yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but how is it that, you know, hypothetically speaking, let me just say that, <laughs> how is it that six bottles of whiskey can just be a jump for? And, you know, I won't say who the culprit is or was, yeah. <laughs> you know, but, but it's, it's just a different dynamic, you know? Yeah. Um, what I'm really, really, you know, happy about is the fact that, you know, we've got the Zoom platform. I mm. speak to my mom and, and my younger brother in Cape Town quite often. Nice. Uh, Mojack also, he, he joined in on the Zoom call. Mm. Um, you know, I think for, for a lot of people, I mean, I, I don't even want to know what people who are doing the lockdown alone are going through mm. because I lost my dad, um, you know, at the end of Jan this year. So it's, it's, still quite soon mm. and I haven't really you know been able to accept that I haven't dealt with it and I think for the first time last night actually it kind of it kind of sunk in that you know I, I won't be able to have conversations with him I won't be able to share my recipes with my dad and things like that you know and and how close were you with your dad extremely extremely mm. You know, I, I, when I had that moment, thank God Isaac was here and, you know, Amma was here and, you know, th these are the, these are the types of things that you should never take for granted. You know, I thought about it today and I was like, when this lockdown ends and I'm with my family or with a group of people, 
I'm going to leave my phone in the car. Yeah, fuck you. I'm going to leave my phone in the car because conversations are just so beautiful. You know, being able to have conversations, being able to look at somebody's facial expression, their body language, you know, to smell them, to, you know, take a menu and see what everybody's ordering and together, it's like, fuck, you know? We, we take that shit for granted. We come to a gathering with all our problems and we're morbid and we, we don't celebrate one another. We don't appreciate one another, you know? And, and I wonder, you know, if my dad was still here, how he'd be taking this lockdown, you know? Because my dad loved nature. My dad loved the outdoors. My dad was a pigeon fancier. I mean, which black man is going to raise pigeons, you know, <laughs> in 2020? Yeah, you know? yeah, 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 yeah. And, and it's like, well, what would he think? You know, what would he, what would he think about, you know, the recipes that we're making? You know, the, the I mean, yesterday I made naan bread. So, you know, I, I think the lockdown has done so much good for me as a person. Mm. You know, having introspection, having perspective, getting perspective, learning uh, about my partner. What were you doing before lockdown? Um, were you busy uh, with anything? So um, I, I was doing a couple of stand-ins for Mix FM. Okay. It's out here in Midrand. Um, very different, I won't lie, you know, um, different sound, different audience. Um, but, but radio is radio, man. Like, mm. if, if you can get into a studio, there's a mic, there's a desk, you've got music and, and your passion and your talent, then we're good. So I was doing a couple of stand-ins uh, at Mix and... I think the the idea of going back to radio full time was just fantastic, you know. Mm -hmm. But I was also doing some business development management um, for a creative agency in Randburg. Nice. And nice. you know, it's probably the most difficult job in the world, you mm -hmm. know. Um, again, you know, people's perspective of you know hiring somebody who comes from the industry is like totally skewed because they think that you're going to get us business because you are in the industry and you know a whole bunch of people. Mm. Um, the first thing that any company cuts is their marketing budget. You know, mm. um, people don't have money. The economy is absolutely in shit. Mm. So I was trying everything to get jobs for this company. I mean, it's a great company, great people, young, diverse, fantastic. And that kind of also, put a damper on what I was trying to pursue in radio because I couldn't do both. Mm. Um, and I had to choose and I, and I, and I chose to, to do the business development thing. Are you, are you planning on going back onto TV, um, um, uh, radio, even Metro FM? Like have you burnt your bridges at ACBC or is it still an open door? Look, um, you know, after my dad passed away, I, you know, I, I, learned a lot more about what my dad did and what he was about. I mean, he was so passionate about education. Um, he was really, really passionate about just people, you know. Um, I'm so happy that we've been able to submit his thesis um, posthumously. So, you know, hopefully we can do that at the end of the year. And just based on everything that happened, I decided to sort of get involved with some of the business that my dad used to do. So funny enough, I'm actually working in the space of litigation and data analysis and capturing. Um, we have such a great uh, contract with the Department of Health um, to bring down their contingency. You know, people just want to sue the government, which is fair because of medical negligence. But we're trying to paint the government in a better light, especially the Department of Health. We're trying to bring change to that. I think it's very important for me to, to share that message with everyone, but I also can't take away from the fact that I have a voice, I have a talent, I, I love radio, I love television, but things are very different, you know, things have changed. If you don't so have the following- you'll, you'll never go to Metro FM again. If you can get me there. <laughs> who we must I sleep know. with? Who, who must I sleep with? <laughs> you sleep with someone for me. Uh, <laughs> yes. You know, I've been, I've been watching, I've been watching Ozark. And yeah. the amount of ideas. 
that I'm just like, oh, I'm going to save this for a rainy day, shit. Like, it's crazy. Yeah. But, you know, I, I, I don't know if it's a pride thing, you know, but I, I one book that I actually urge a lot of people to read, I forget the author, is a book called Talent is Never Enough. And the beginning, like, of the, of the book, it talks about this guy who's in the street, talented as fuck, plays the saxophone, like, nobody's business. But he's poor. He, he's not, like, on any big stage. I mean, he's talented, but what, what, what else does he need to be as big as, I, you know, uh, Kenny G, for example, you know? So... It, it put things into such perspective for me because that's right, talent is, is never enough. You can be so talented, you can be so opinionated, you can have a voice, you can have a story, by the way, because I think I've got a fucking good story, you know? Maybe we can add a little bit of juice, yeah, but I've got a great story. But are there platforms to share those stories, you know? Mm -hmm. um, maybe also my downfall is that I'm half Sutu, but can't even string a sentence together so that's why you'll never see me on any vernac i don't know soapy you know yeah. so and, and and i did drama in high school i i it was my eighth subject and i got an a for that so i can act you know? mm. but i'm not an actress i'm not a dj you know people say you can make so much more money if you dj but that thing terrifies me that thing, that thing's all like <laughs> Me. Like what is going on? You know, I can't. The only thing I can do is just appreciate the music and just say make some noise for my G. You know? Yeah, yeah. But I think that, and, and and it's okay to get the bag and try and do as many things as you can. Mm -hmm. But you know what's also wrong with you know sticking to who you are and focusing on your niche and mm. saying i'm a tv and radio personality if there are no opportunities then i'm gonna go and be a lawyer mm. <laughs> Shit, man yeah. we're almost out of time man I, I wanted to ask you before we go um i see i hear in a lot of songs like i'm catching feelings like sammy sosa blah blah, yes. blah. Are, they, are they talking about you there what's going on there so you know i'm just gonna let the cat out of the bag and say that you know AK wasn't rapping about me, you know. Sammy Sosa is, you know, an incredible baseball player from the United States. And yes, I always knew who that was, you know. Sammy Sosa, I don't even think was, was my idea when I first got into the industry. You know, I, I was cool with Sam Luhoko, but it is obviously too boring. I don't know if I had to marry somebody and change my surname to make it sound a little bit more, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Um, but it stuck and yes, a lot of young and talented kids have made songs about me, um, you know, very catchy tracks, um, which, which I appreciate so much, you know. Um, and it doesn't matter that it was never as big as, you know, MT Pearl Tootsie. No, but, but I always say, I always say, if, if someone hasn't made a song about you, you're not a celeb. <laughs> hey! There were a couple. There were a couple of songs, I must say. Not just two, not three, but maybe 15. Yeah. You know, and we'll say that yes, AK was talking about me. Yeah, you know. for the sake of the podcast. <laughs> and for the sake of my, my career as well. You know? Because I mean, they did. They did catch emotions. You know, people yeah. have emotions. You know, yeah. it's a real uh, including Including you, you know. Yeah. So, I, I, you know, for me, it's like, I, I'm not afraid to, to share my story. I'm not afraid or ashamed to be honest about things. Mm. I've been through loss. Mm. I've been through, you know, some really, really great moments in my career. I've been through some really shitty moments in my career. I, I think those who are still standing and still doing their thing and still pushing, good for them. You know and what, what do you think now that you kind of like, you know, um, out of the industry, what do you think looking at it? Like, do you see people in like, shit, she's going through what I'm going through or like, fuck, what's going on here? I don't know. I, I, I don't know because mm. I've never made people's business my business. Ah, I've got you. I've, I've never, I've never in my entire life come in, like said, you know, I, I need to know what's going on there and I need to, you know, be having a conversation about other people and, you know, I've never used... But, but you're happy with the state of radio, state of TV right now? Are you happy with it? Of course not. Of course yeah, not. yeah, yeah. Uh, like, it is... 
you know, radio um, used to be such a powerful, powerful tool. I mean, that's where you heard, you know, the breaking news. That's where, you know, you heard the latest songs, you know. But do people not listen to radio anymore because there's a lack of talent and people don't know what they're talking about? Or is it because we have Spotify and iTunes and Deezer and all that other shit, you know? What, what is, why are we not listening to radio? Why are we not as enthusiastic about radio as what we used to be? I mean, there are still a great number of people who listen to radio, you know? And I still think that there are some incredibly talented people on air right now. Um, I back them, you know, I have them on my Insta, you know, but I don't think it's the same. And I, and I, I kind of feel like there are people who have such incredible ideas for television, but we would rather just watch I mean, you say it. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna throw anybody under the bus. You say something. <laughs> but I mean, there are things that we are watching mm-hmm. where we're not growing the industry. We're not saying, okay, let's spend an hour watching a show about, I don't know, the next young politician. Mm-hmm. I, I don't know. Like something ridiculous. Like let's take like 20 young people, put them in a house. And yes, you know, maybe there'll be love affairs and whatever, but the end goal is to be the next, uh, I don't know, minister of health or whatever the case is. I I don't don't fucking know. But Mm. why are we so fixated on, you know, watching somebody's reality show when they do nothing for our soul, for our health, for our families? It's like, like, I don't know. And it's yeah. not even coming from a place of regret or hatred or whatever the case is. Because yeah, or malice, I can, yeah. You know, yeah, I can tell you now that, that, that there are people who are still on television who I, whose music I play, whose, you know, Insta stories I watch, mm. whose pictures I like, you know, and that's genuine because I, I genuinely like these people. Wow, man. You know, what I love about you is what I've noticed and during this interview is that you're not afraid to be naked, you know? And what I mean by that is not, you're not afraid to be yourself and tell your story. And I Absolutely. think it's great because a lot of people might think you've fallen off and all that shit. But in, in reality, you learn more from your failures than you do your success, you know? Absolutely. And I feel like whatever journey you're going through right now, you're getting prepared for something that is even going to be bigger than you ever thought it was oh, going to be. You know what I mean? Absolutely. Yeah. Look, Mac, I, I always say that your 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 biggest mistake is your best teacher. Yeah. You know? And it's like if you are not learning from these mistakes, you're nothing. You're mm. absolutely nothing. You know? Mm. Mm. And uh, you know, I tell my partner this all the time. I'm like, you know, we're in a relationship to be naked. Well, sometimes. <laughs> but, but also, but also <laughs> vulnerable. You know what I mean? Naked on the inside. You know what I mean? We're, we're, we're here to to be vulnerable, you know, and it's okay to be vulnerable. We have we have feelings. We all you know go through the same shit, and if we can just look at you know we do this often. We look at the guys in the states and we're like, yeah, but Mang Mang hasn't released an album for two years and they're still relevant. They're still making money. They're still doing all of that shit. We need to adopt the same mentality here because if you haven't seen me for two years, the talent has not left. Mm. You know. Mm-hmm. still the same person i'm still working on my own stuff and it's okay to put the fame aside i can still be successful in a different industry i can mm-hmm. still be successful in a different space i can still be successful with different friends mm-hmm. you know and um things do happen for a reason and i think that you know this lockdown is going to change the world nothing will ever be the same when yeah. the lockdown ends, i'll let the cats go to the club let yeah. them go yeah you know yeah. but what is important is I may not see the person that I love again, you hmm. know, or something hmm. might happen to me and they might never see me again. So hmm. during this lockdown, I mean, behind me, I have 23 letters hmm. that my partner and I have written to each other. So oh, wow. every day during the lockdown, we write each other a letter and we have a theme for that day. And even if we have a fight, we, we share that in the letter. Hmm. And I'm going to look back and I'm going to read you know, however long this fucking lockdown is, I'm going to have to go through fucking letters. But (laughs) I know that I would have made the most incredible memories of my life. Wow, Sammy. Couldn't have closed it at a better note. Thank you so much for joining me, man. Are you crying, Matt? No, 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 no. no. (laughs) 
Hey, great. I, I wish, are you, are you drinking there? Because I wish we no. could have had a, a shot or a toast or something, a virtual. Dude, I, I ran out of alcohol like two weeks within the lockdown, bro. I'm so fucked. Of course you did. I'm sorry, buddy. I'll, I'll think about sending location. Yeah, <laughs> would be nice. But thank you so much, Sammy Sosa. I wish you all the best in your career. And I know you're going to do great things. It was such an honor to catch up with you, man. Thank you so much, Mac. Everything of the best for you as well. Good luck with your podcast. I'd love for you to invite me back, maybe with five, ten other people. Yes, and, yes, uh, yeah, yeah. You're fantastic yeah. as well. You know, yeah. if, you, if, you, if you Google, whoever is watching this, if you Google Mac G, you'll find some incredible things about this man. I won't even lie. <laughs> thank you so much, Sammy. <laughs> Thanks, Mac. I'll talk to you soon. All right, cheers, love. Bye. Bye. For more information, visit www.workbox.co.za. Podcast and chill. Matt G, the ghost lady, and Len Moleko.